Hello, and welcome to a very special edition of the Lucky Trader Podcast. Today, we are joined by legendary crypto artist Trevor Jones to talk about his artistic journey, the early days in NFTs, how he approaches social media and marketing, his views on the current state of the crypto art market, and much, much more. As a quick background on Trevor, for those listeners who may not be familiar, He's one of the earliest artists who created crypto and digital art, publishing his Genesis piece, ETH Girl, on Super Rare in December 2019. His style is known for his allusion to cryptocurrency, and crypto is thematic in his work. He is a record-setting artist, having set records with his Bitcoin Angel Open Edition on Nifty Gateway, and is known to throw one hell of a castle party. Trevor, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thanks so much for having me, Tyler. Nice to, to be here, and yeah, looking forward to this. Awesome. Well, let's get right into it. First, I'm excited for our conversation. You're such an OG in this space. And I think a lot of newcomers who have entered you know, over the last few years will really benefit from hearing your story. And you know, for me, one place I always like to start is just with some background. So maybe just catch us up on you know, where you come from and kind of how you got started in the crypto and digital art. Uh, I'm probably kind of like the the poster boy for never give up because uh, I'm I'm what 52 now. I forget how old I am. That's how how old I am. Uh, I came from a in a tiny little working class community in in Western Canada, uh, British Columbia, and about 1,200 people logging community. Um, you know, I never planned on being an artist. Uh, you know, you don't you don't grow up in a place like that thinking that you're going to be an artist. Although I I was always I enjoyed art and I, and I took, I always laugh, you know, I took art classes in, in elementary school and in high school because it was easy. Uh, it was an easy mark, not because I was planning on being an artist, because, you know, what was the point of doing that? You drive a truck or you, you know, you work in the mill. Um, it wasn't until I started traveling. I left when I was about 25 years old to backpack around the world, uh, was all over the place, ended up in Scotland in 1999. Uh, had an early midlife crisis around 30, 31, and decided uh, art was going to save me. It was going to answer all the big questions in my life. And uh, I think, ironically, it just brought more questions to the, the table. But at the same time, um, yeah, it's been an a, a interesting journey. I, I did a, a foundation year here in Scotland, in, in Edinburgh, at a, a small independent school, and then applied to art college. I uh, did five years. It was an MA split degree. Um, studying history of art at Edinburgh University and focusing on drawing and painting at Edinburgh College of Art and graduated in 2008. So that was what, 14, 15 years ago. And uh, yeah, it's been uh, quite the journey. Indeed, that is a lengthy one um, and a pretty incredible start there from, from where you started to, to where you've gotten. I'm curious, you know, for those who, who aren't familiar, how, how would you describe your art and its themes and its styles? <laughs> I guess it depends on how far you want to look back. I, I've I've always changed a lot, you know, when I was purely a, a traditional painter, you know, I went through themes of more abstract expressionism, focused on, you know, in, in inspired by music, um, synesthesia. Uh, then I was painting QR codes. I, I, I stumbled onto, well, I, I think I was always interested in how technology and innovation could be used to engage the viewer in a, a new and exciting way to a, a traditional artwork like a painting. So that was kind of took me to QR codes in 2011, 2012. Um, and then I you know, what uh, kind of fell into augmented reality. I was just, once I started kind of playing around with like this, the possibilities that technology had to offer, I was always kind of looking around, seeing what was, what was out there, what I could incorporate into a painting. So, NFC tags in 2015, but yeah, AR in 2013. So that was, I was able to now stop painting these ridiculous squares of, of QR codes. Um, but uh, I thought they were very, very cool and linked to a, an online website that became a, a gallery for other artists to showcase their work and, and that, in a way kind of building community back 12, 13 years ago from that. Um, but then with augmented reality, the, I guess the, the thread that kind of carries it all through is technology and that although the themes and the ideas have changed you know constantly throughout my, my work um the styles um the topics that it's 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 been this kind of fascination with 
technology, which now has led me to crypto, you know, led to crypto in 2017 and falling down that rabbit hole. Uh, and then to NFTs, some, um, you know, having a crypto themed exhibition in 2018. And so I guess probably for the last five, six years now, um, it really is, it's my, my style, I guess, would be, like you said, uh, you know, crypto themed work that explores this, this crazy volatile, um, exciting space that we're in, um, the characters, you know, people, the, 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 the heroes, the villains, um, you know, the ideas and themes and, and concepts around it. Um, but at the same time, I still kind of go in and out, you know, I did a, a Metacast, it was a whiskey uh, NFT um, for 1991 McCallum's cask of whiskey that ended up selling for 2.3 million. I did a, that collab with Ice Cube. So, you know, I, I like to kind of go all over. I don't want to be stuck in one kind of corner. Uh, I'm, I, I find an idea, something that gets me excited, and I just kind of go from there and see how best to visually represent it and explore the, the idea itself. Oh, that's a... <clears throat> An amazing description, and I want to come back to the, the collab with Ice Cube because that was definitely something that kind of perked my interest. Um, you mentioned that the, the QR code scanning and AR and then crypto and, and NFT. So I'm curious, you know, how would you say your views of how where art meets technology have evolved over the last few years? So when we go to the Trevor Jones art website, I've got pulled up right here. We see where art meets technology. I'm that's clearly deep in your work. And I'm just curious, you know, for your perspective on how your views there have changed and, and grown over the years. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's been uh, such a, a journey from, let's say, like, you know, that 2010 uh, exhibition of Synesthesia. So I, I, um, it was my first solo exhibition at a commercial gallery and I, all the works were inspired by uh, a unique tradition or unique uh, contemporary Scottish song. Um, people like, you know, Annie Lennox and Biffy Clyro and, and uh, was it Primal Scream, all these different uh, Scottish artists and each painting was the represent visual, my visual interpretation of a particular song. Um, but I also brought in a, a MP3 players into the commercial gallery, the gallery so the viewers could actually listen to the song that inspired the, that painting. Um, That's really you know, cool. And it's, yeah, it was, it was, it was idea. I mean, the, the, the concept of, of synesthesia or a, 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 an artist linking visual artists, like painters linking colors to music and rhythms and, you know, has been around for, for hundreds of years, but being able to bring an MP3 player into a, a gallery visitors could which I, I was wondering it's like well this could actually backfire because what if the person likes the painting but absolutely despises the song and then you're like oh my god what's the you know that's not a good but i just i like the idea and the concept and the experiment and it ended up doing really really well so i think from very early on i was already already thinking like how can i incorporate new um media new new things new technology into like i said and get better engaging the viewer um which then led me to qr codes it was 2011 where my next solo show and i was seeing these qr codes around and i wondered what they were so i did a bit of research and then found out that i could actually create my own qr code that would link to something and then i could i was wondering well can I actually paint these things i use that initially as to, as promotional material for my exhibition to, but before the exhibition even opened i was already thinking like what if i I wonder if I can paint a QR code that scans, that works. And, and if I can, what, what should it link to? What's the, the reason for it to exist? And um, yeah, so I mean, that just kind of exp went on from there. Funny thing was, you know, I, I thought like, this is it. This is, nobody's doing anything like this. Um, and then to build a website that uh, uh, would become this online gallery platform with hundreds and hundreds of artists around the world to upload in their work. And I thought this is genius. Um, but nobody liked the paintings except for me. So uh, it was, uh, it, it, I guess it prepared me for what was going to be the next, what, seven years of, of rejection as I mm -hmm. fell down this, this hole of, of tech and innovation with a traditional painting. It was literally trying to smash a, a, a square peg down a, 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 you know, a, a round hole type thing that the people who were in the, the traditional art world 
um, just weren't interested at all in what I was doing. Um, so yeah, there's many, many times when I thought I just need to give this up and focus on more traditional painting. Yeah, I think that's something that happens when you are you know, so early. And I think that's something that struck me about uh, synesthesia, right? And that, that immersive experience that you were able to create by having two mediums, right? Sound mm -hmm. as well as the visual piece. And I think that's something we've certainly seen grow a lot over the last few years. I think the, the traveling Van Gogh exhibit is a huge one. Mm -hmm. This has gone crazy across the US and people just seem to universally really enjoy that. I think because of the immersion and it's so interesting to hear, you know, you were doing that 13 years ago. <laughs> um, along with then the, the QR codes and, and you mentioned rejection. So you know, this is 2012. You are, are, are painting the QR codes this a couple of years after synesthesia, you know, what, you know, in, in a few seconds or minutes, kind of what does the fast forward look like across those next five years, you know, as we get um, from, you know, more physical IRL work into digital art, into publishing on super rare in 2019. It was a lot of of rejection, a lot of me questioning everything that I was doing um, and wondering why. Literally questioning my own sanity, thinking like, I think this is right. I think I'm on the right track. But it's it was tough times. I mean, I was working two jobs. Um, I, I was running a small arts charity. I was I was uh, teaching part time at an art school. You would have to pick up a couple shifts once in a while back at you know waitering. Uh, I had it, you know, I had a couple spare rooms in the flat. So I was Airbnb and them. And then, you know, I was working seven days a week just to be able to pay the bills to, for this very expensive hobby of, and I was at that time, I was also organized my own exhibitions because the galleries weren't interested in showing my work anymore. So I would hire a gallery space. I would put on the open night, buy all the wine, do all the invites, do all the marketing. Um, and usually you know, those first, th you know, 2014, 15, 16 was literally just making ends meet barely. Um, and, and again, like I was putting my work into open exhibitions, submitting it to jury panels, rejection, you know, the, the amount of rejection letters I was getting um, did make me question if what I was doing was right. But like I said, it, it made sense to me. I think maybe a bit of a, a chip on my shoulder I just every rejection letter I got, I was like, you know what, fuck it, I'm I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this work somehow. I I don't know how, but I'm going to figure it out. And that was, yeah. So it brought me to 2016 with the uh, Would I Lie to You exhibition with all the politicians and world leaders. That was made out of you can see Trump there, and uh, you know, made out of rubbish that I found on the streets and an oil paint, and they had uh, they're all augmented reality. So I put together these short clips of of basically these world leaders talking a lot of rubbish. And there was 10 portraits in total, all the same size. And one of my collectors, longtime collectors, actually bought the entire series, the whole set. Wow. Which surprised me because um, I didn't think anybody, this for me, this was kind of my last ditch attempt to raise my profile as an artist who's doing something really cool with technology to be able to tell a story with video and, and music and, and animation or whatever through the painting by scanning it and you know having something such uh, a, a topic of politics during the Hillary Clinton Trump uh, right it was actually the opening night was on the the night of the election so it did generate a lot of interest but I didn't think that anybody would buy the paintings and so the fact that this this collector of mine did buy them all it gave me um, number one it gave me some confidence that there was potential in what I was doing. Um, but also it gave me for the first time a little extra money uh, in, in the bank account, Always which the, yeah, that was very, very, very important because that was, I then had the, the first time ever to the opportunity to look at investing and which led me to Bitcoin. So that was a few months later, I was looking at Bitcoin and thinking like, Ooh, I don't know about this. And, and, and then eventually um, I basically <laughs> invested everything I had into Bitcoin and then started thinking like, you know, getting into crypto and, and buying and selling and found that I was an absolutely horrible trader. I was a much better painter. 
and I made a bunch of money in from 2000, what June, 2017 to December. And then the crash happened in January, 2018. And I basically lost everything I made and all the money I'd made for my paintings too. <laughs> I, I was going to ask what, at what point in 2017 did, did you get in? Because if you were early, yeah, you had some nice returns, but then it was June, 2017. So I think Bitcoin at the time was 3000 or less than 3000 and it pumped up to 20 grand. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I mean, it was impossible to lose money at that point and, and I was doing pretty well, but yeah, I, I was a noob. I, I was making really, really bad decisions. Um, and then by that time, by the end of 2017, I was already um, working on my this crypto disruption exhibition. I was excited about this whole space. Um, I didn't know what it was. I was going and I was essentially trying to find visuals to, you know, an, an inspiration for a series of paintings that represented my understanding of this crazy crypto space. Um, yeah, I didn't know that within kind of three, well, probably about four or five months in 2018 that I can be completely broke again. I have no money and I was already fully invested into a crypto disruption exhibition that would open up in October uh, of that year. And again, not knowing if anybody would want to buy these paintings because I didn't know, I, I was looking online, there was literally, I couldn't find any artists, painters or commercial galleries that were selling crypto themed paintings. So I'm thinking at that point, man, I just, I, I finally had some money and then I just threw it all away with this crazy, crazy idea. But what happened is that as I was working on this exhibition, I was posting on Twitter, uh, work in progress paintings um, right from the very beginning, uh, you know, from the canvas to, to developing the ideas. And, and by the time I started actually showing some work that was finished, um, there was people around the world contacting me, asking me for, how much it cost, you know, could they buy it? And I think I sold the first one, the Satoshi, uh, the architect portrait. It was probably about three months before the exhibition, I think August um, of 2018. And this guy just contacted me through my website. He said he saw it on Twitter, um, wanted this painting, asked me how much. I said, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. I said, I think I just said 5,000 pounds, which was a lot of money for me. Um, I think my paintings at that point were commercial galleries would have been selling for less than half that. So I just threw a number out there. And next thing you know, he sent me the, that amount in Bitcoin to my wallet. And I'm like, holy shit, this is, I don't, this is crazy. Yeah. It's like, this it's guy doesn't know who I am. So yeah, he doesn't, it's not going, we're not going through a gallery. Um, you know, this, there's a tr obviously a huge amount of trust there that he, he knows I'm going to se send this painting to him. And I actually emailed him back. So like, you know, I, this is brilliant, but I have to put the ex exhibition on first. So I'll send you the painting in November, um, even though he paid in August. He says, yeah, no, no worries, no rush. And that's kind of how it went from there. Next thing, my next painting sold again a few weeks later, the, the hodler to um, my longest, uh, longest and one of my best friend collectors, Motorats in the space, who's been a, a huge, huge support for many, many artists. So we've had a, a very strong relationship for, for many years now. And yeah, it kind of just went from there. Wow. What a story. I mean, first, just the amount of grit and determination to, to keep going for four years, five years, you know, through that, that process, you know, while, you know, no one was really biting. Um, that, that's amazing. Taking huge risks. Um, I think I want to reflect quickly on, that Bitcoin transaction, right? So like, was that your aha moment that, you know, there, that, that crypto removed so many barriers from like the physical and traditional art space and how payments are done and how, you know, artists can connect with collectors. I'm curious, you know, for your reactions, you know, kind of stepping back from that moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it just, it literally blew my mind. I had no, I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, I, I knew I was going to have 12 to 14 large oil paintings that I would show, I would hire a gallery space and, and basically take pictures of it to put online on Twitter of this exhibition and knowing full well that nobody in Edinburgh would buy any of these works. So it was just, like I said, a Hail Mary throw, you know, that, that something would happen. And the fact that then this one guy, and he's he's not, I don't even know if he 
buys NFTs. You know, we haven't had any really much conversation since since he bought the painting in 2018. Um, but he just he's big into the crypto scene and uh, he he liked it and he said he just he sent me the the Bitcoin. I think at that time it was something like I don't know. 1.4 to two bitcoin something like that i mean it was bitcoin was pretty low at that at that point yeah, and <laughs> so once that happened that transaction happened it did definitely open my eyes i think like i said it was just kind of blew me away that somebody would actually do that they would send a bitcoin you know one one and a half bitcoin to me um on the hopes that i would send them this this painting but again that was my reputation so and i had everything online my life online you know it wasn't like i was anonymous i think that was another interesting thing you know people say you know most people most so many artists in the space are anonymous um you know they have a an avatar you know we over time we kind of got to know who who most of these people are they dox themselves but sure. i doxed myself right from the very beginning and and i didn't realize that um you know the, what the advantages or disadvantages were to that but i think that did help me in the long run at the very beginning because everybody knew who i was you know there was a there's a history there you can see the website all my social media twitter facebook you know that i used when i used to use that um but it's it was definitely a learning experience to begin interacting with a lot of anonymous collectors around the world and just have these these Twitter DMs with them or emails and and talk about art and and crypto. Yeah, it highlights so many aspects of the the, the crypto NFT Web three space with you know the amount of trust, how mm -hmm. important reputations are, um, and how like Twitter has has been such an important part of connecting creators to collectors and community building, which I do want to touch on you know later in our discussion. But you know, while we're we're going through your artistic journey, I I want to hit on a few pieces here, um, especially some of your early super rare pieces. Um, so I, I'm gonna pull up Eat Girl for us. So this is your generous your Genesis super rare mint, correct? Back December 2019. Uh, I'd love just to get the, the quick story, um, you know, for, from what went into this piece and how you went about executing it. I. I First heard about NFTs in April 2019. I uh, went to a conference that called my very first crypto conference, uh, CoinFest in Manchester. And I didn't get my head around, I couldn't understand what why I would want to be involved with these because I was a, saw myself as a traditional painter. I was selling physical paintings. But within a few months, I started to um, kind of get my head around what this new uh, type of art and um platform was and the opportunities and it was talking to more artists you know more as as you know it was a very very close-knit small community of nfts and crypto artists at that time um but just getting to know them and that's when i i got i was chatting with uh, a lot of money who uh um rest in peace uh one of the the great ogs and i said look you know i don't know anything about this nft space you know i'm just an old painter can you help me out um can we do like some kind of collaboration or something and he said yeah ab ab absolutely of course uh, he was the kind of guy he just you know he just loved doing collabs and, and working with everybody and he was you know it, it became such an important person for for me and so many others in the space and i said look i've got this series of picasso themed inspired paintings um but also that represent elements and, and symbols and um, icons of this crypto world. Uh, can we do something together uh, where it can breaks apart like it's a you know cubist type painting and we'll have like a, some kind of tribute to Picasso in the background and and he said well, yeah and so we we just basically threw ideas around and eventually came up with this iconic piece um, and it, yeah I mean it was it was an amazing moment again that was like another crazy time for me because um that was december 2019 i think december 14th and it ended up turning into an, a crazy crazy um bidding war between motorats and whale shark that ended up selling for just 70 eth and yeah i mean just complete that was 10 a massive ten thousand dollars which was was huge um huge huge for us 
and but also it made me think like wow it's like somebody is actually investing uh i think the the highest one at that nft sale at that point before that was about fourteen hundred dollars but this yeah. really opened up the eyes of myself and, and and all the other artists in the space that this is this is something new that this is we can actually make a living selling nft Tees. We can make a, actually a really good living as an artist selling digital work. Um, so that was a, a real kind of moment for for the community itself, and and yeah, then the rest is history. And, and well deserved. I mean, this this is an iconic piece. I think when I, when I think about <clears throat> early crypto art, I mean, this is definitely on that that Mount Rushmore for me. Um, but but you didn't stop. If anything, you just you were just getting started. With, with digital art, right? So that was ETH Girl was a collab. Mm -hmm. Who is the creator? Was your first solo piece, if, if I understand correctly. So I'd love to hear kind of how that creation process was different than than ETH Girl. It was different because because I didn't have a lot of with me working on this piece. Um, so I I had like I said the series of of Picasso inspired tribute paintings. And because I'm a, a traditional painter, I'm not a digital artist. I, I do a lot of work in Photoshop, but I don't do any, I've got no knowledge around animation. So I knew that I was going to have to work with somebody else to, to animate my painting. And instead of doing a collaboration, I decided to outsource the, the, the work, the actual animation part. And I had a feeling that it might get some pushback because in this early days of this this space it really was a uh, you know you you this is it, whether it was your self-taught artist or you you know most were self-taught and and you know you kind of created the work and this is and this is who it is this everybody knew it's either this artist or this collaboration and me hiring somebody outsourcing i end up figuring that you know just to be sure i'm going to write a, a long blog post about collaborations Spanning back to the Renaissance and you know going forward to Picasso and and Jeff Koons and workshops and Andy Warhol and Damien Hirst and, and really kind of focus on on all these different types of creative collaborations and why they did them and 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 that kind of thing what what came out of out of all these collaborations and I posted this I put it on Twitter but this was really before um, you know I mean people knew who I was but. It was along. It was back in the early days, and at one point, I think it was probably about four or five months after this piece came out. I'd obviously been working on other pieces, um, higher outsourcing. That somebody found out that I wasn't the animator for these works, and again, like it was, it was like I got a lot of pushback from it. So that was, um, I mean, you know, I was I was ready for it. I was prepared for it. But that then led me to collaboration with Jose Delo, who is uh, an OG of OGs of the traditional world with, and we did the, the Batman series of, of work. And as I kind of, it was kind of like a, you know, a, a two fingers up to, to the people who didn't think that um, what I was doing was legitimate because I outsourced it. So I, um, I went to Jose and who I think is, was at the time was probably about 82 years old. And I was like 50 or whatever, 40, 40, 49. So like probably the two of the oldest guys in the space is like, you know, let's, do you want to shake this, shake this up? I said like, you know, I'm go I would like to you to give me one or two of your drawings of your comic drawings. I'm going to basically, I, I said like, I, I can't tell you what I'm going to do to, to it or what's, what we're going to do, but please just trust me. And surprisingly, he said, okay, here you go. And, and about a couple of weeks later, he gave me some, some two drawings and one of them uh, was called the who's, who's I call it who's the creator too and that essentially was me taking his work and then hiring an animator to animate it exactly how I want it to hiring a, a musician to create the music for it um, basically producing it you know directing it putting the whole thing together and and then dropping it as my collaboration with Jose Delvo when re really I had I did zero actual you know animation work or physical work it wasn't my my painting it wasn't my drawing wasn't my and uh, and that ended up like breaking all records on at that time i think it was like 300 
or no, 540 ETH on Maker's Place for the whole series. Um, wow. But again, it was just, I like this space because it's it's always gives you opportunities to to trailblaze, to, to try new things, to experiment. Um, and people in the space collectors want innovation. They want they want edgy. They want they want somebody to to mix things up and and see what happens. Oh, I'm definitely with you there. And those that continue to in, innovate and push the envelope are the ones who are succeeding. I think that that can't be denied. I, I have to ask though. So you, your your start in crypto was with Bitcoin, but your genesis piece was was ETH. So is that at the tip of the cap that are, are you secretly an ETH maxi over Bitcoin or, or what, uh, how, how did that all go down? Um, well, this was, so there wasn't really any, I, I didn't know of anybody minting on Bitcoin. I mean, it, you know, ordinal, ordinals are all the, the braids right now. Uh, mm-hmm. I have minted a couple pieces on scarce city with, uh, with those guys. And, um, but it just, ETH was the, the platform super rare, no an origin maker's place uh 2018 19 and and that's all I, all i knew um so that's kind of how that started um i mean with regards to crypto assets i'm pretty much all in on bitcoin but uh you know i i've i th- i think eth is a is a brilliant platform for and it, it it was the ethereum network that really pushed it the whole nft space for and and made a lot of artists um you know a lot of money and uh speaking of a lot of money and and so i think ethereum really helped launch this whole movement um but now i mean it's there's different marketplaces there's different chains there's different you know and and it's just yeah each one does something different of course and i think that that's a a a good say to the the last piece i want to touch on and then we'll get to the open edition and maybe how these are connected but Bitcoin Angel, you know, certainly this is another iconic piece here. Um, I'm very curious for, you know, how you went from the one of one to the, the to the nifty gateway open edition uh, a year later. I'd love to hear that story. So, yeah, it started off as a painting from my 2018 Crypto Disruption exhibition. And that was, yeah, I started early 2018. So I hadn't even, NFTs weren't even out at that time. Um, it ended up selling to somebody I knew and I ended up, uh, what that was 2020, I dropped this, I think it was actually on my birthday, March 26th, possibly. Um, and Basilius, uh, another great collector and friend won this piece. Now, uh, this was actually an animation. So I was able to add music to it. Unlike the old GIF format or, or JPEG whatever um it, it was a continuation of you know what i was trying to do with augment reality back in the day of, of creating a, a traditional artwork and then bringing it another kind of bringing it back to life in a different way through animation and music so that's how this piece developed and, and kind of the meaning significance behind it and i wrote another long blog post about that and then it was 2021 when i did my pellet to canvas uh drop on nifty gateway and i think it was like a ret- the, the 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 first and so far probably only retrospective exhibition in the crypto and nft art space but i spoke to um i to the guy who actually owned the physical piece and i said like look i'm doing this exhibition uh digital exhibition on nifty gateway he didn't really know what NFTs were uh, he's actually not in the in the space but I said, I would like to sell, resell this painting for you, if that's okay with you. And I'm going to attach it to this digital piece as a, a, of one of one. And then at the same time, I think open editions were really kind of taken off at that point. I'd already done an open edition with PAC uh, in the end of 2020. And I thought that the, the Bitcoin angel, out of all the pieces in that entire 2018 exhibition, really captured everything about the space in a way that none of the other paintings did. And, and that was kind of my kind of way of the, offering this piece as a, as a open edition was kind of, a, you know, thinking about community, but I didn't really know how it would turn out, how it would, how it would go. I had no idea if 
50 would sell or a hundred would sell or a thousand. I didn't know. I didn't think I, I had no idea that this 4,158 would sell. Um, and that brought about its own complications as well. And so over $7 million of secondary market volume on this piece. Am I saying that correctly? Wow. That is yeah. just incredible. So I guess what was this your, I, I made it moment or like, I guess what was your reaction? Like, you know, you would, you were, you've been working at this now for, you know, almost 10 years uh, after being rejected for, for seven, started to have some success on, on super rare, you know, were you able to kind of step back and, and kind of bask in this for a, a little <laughs> while? What were the reactions? Uh, after I, I'd shit myself and <laughs> then I had a couple glasses of wine with my wife. We, we were both like going, holy crap. I mean, the, the, the end of 2020, from like the Bitcoin bull in July of 2020 was really the beginnings of I'm going, like, okay, this is something, this is, this is crazy what's happening right here, right now. And, and it was Pablo who bought the, the Bitcoin bull and we'd had conversations. He said like, Trev, you don't know what's going to happen. What's going to happen in the near future is going to blow you away. And I didn't really believe him, but within six to nine months, it, it all came true. And this was, this one here was the one that kind of just, made me reassess my entire life and be like holy crap or just look back and be like what the what the heck just happened um but again it was you, you, you have to adapt quickly in this space and you have to really in, in, especially when something like this happens it's life changing and there was pushback because of the enormous amount you know and this is okay there were crypto punks but really pfps hadn't taken off and so when 4,158 were minted in seven minutes, um, there were a lot of people who said, like, I've just destroyed my career. You know, I've oversaturated the market. Everything I've got is, you know, is going to be worthless now. And so at the same time, I was over the moon that I was, I just made a bundle of money. But I'm also thinking, like, maybe I just ruined my career and I'm going to have to get a new job or something because nobody's going to take me seriously. But then... The space itself, what I've learned over the, the years I've been in, that things change so rapidly. Within three months, what was maybe frowned upon or looked at, you know, with disdain, all of a sudden that's the new thing. That's that's what's happening now. People are doing this, um, you know, and and it's taken me a while to get my head around it. That at the end of the day, if you go into any kind of drop, um, you know, and you go in with good intentions, and it's not a, a money grab. You, you're literally trying to, you know, just get your, your art out there and you do it with, with, you know, good, uh, uh, good intentions. It's not up. To, it's not whatever happens. It's not your fault. You know, it's the, it's the market, the market decides what's going to happen. And, yep. and then you as an, as an artist have to adapt and say, okay, the market decided this now, either, you know, it's a complete failure or it's a massive success. And that brings about its own, situation and complications now now what do i have to do so it's always you know being able to move around and, and be adaptable to what is what happens in, in this space it's completely different than the traditional art market which is so slow moving you work for a year you put together an exhibition it may or may not do well and then you got to go okay now what i'm gonna do for next year in this space it's like what i'm gonna do for like you know next month I mean, I, I'm not an artist, of course. Um, I can't imagine going back to traditional art after after seeing the the adrenaline rush that yeah. is the the digital art and crypto art space. Um, you know, you, you mentioned a little bit on cycles and trends, and there was a bit of an open edition meta that did happen back in 2021 over on the Gateway. You mentioned it kind of fell out of the season there a little bit a few months later. Well, guess what? Fast forward to, to 2023. Now it is super hot again. So I'm curious, did that surprise you or kind of what's been your reactions to watching the, this new open edition craze? Uh, play it, out? it surprised me. Um, the, I think the, the bubble burst to a certain extent. I think, you know, all the stars just line up in the space at times and and who, whichever artists are there to capitalize, um, you know, is great. But at the same time, it does bring about a lot of um, a lot of grifters and a lot of cash grabs. And you know, people ask me why why didn't I 
put out an open edition. And first off, like, I'm working on a like this huge painting behind me and this whole steampunk series, which has been a, the never ending two year process of and and you know an enormous project. And so I've got nothing new to to show um, or to put out there. Now I've got a huge back catalog. I got tons of artwork that I still have in my studio. Uh, I could have put something together and thrown out, you know, some kind of cryptic messages about potential utility. Do an open edition on manifold, um, you know, throw in some burn mechanisms and raked in a big bag of ETH, and then I just look like a dick because it's what's what's the point? You know, now now again, like there's consequences, and and there's you put yourself as an artist you put yourself into a, a very difficult situation if you do something like that because i mean yeah you just everybody knows who's grabbing the money and and who's actually coming at it with good intentions um i think it's a great opportunity for less you know the less established artists to get their work out there to build community to potentially make you know whether it's three ETH or five ETH, you know it's like you know life-changing money, uh, especially depending where you live. But I, you know, I'm not going to mention, you know, there, it, it got to the point where every day there'd be another artist going like, you know, just throwing out some, something just to cash in on, on the manifold open edition season. And yeah. I think that just, it's, it's not a good look. And if they can sleep at night, then great, but I couldn't, it would, I, I'd rather keep my soul intact than, walk away with a big bag of ETH. Well, I really appreciate your, your, your perspective there. And I'm really curious to watch this play out and see, you know, who did the right way, who maybe did the wrong way and how this may impact their, their career mm -hmm. arc in the, the digital art space. So I do think there will be impacts down the road for some of this. I think one piece that I do like is it does provide a, a lower entry point for mm -hmm. a lot of collectors who, uh, you know, don't have the funds to, to go after the one of one. So I like that side of it. But at the same time, there are certainly the, the artists who've come in and, and, and gotten their money back. You know, yeah. That is yeah. I um, guess, and again, what's going to happen in the future, and we don't know, is which of these artists will still be here in three years, five years, 10 years time. Right. And and if they are, and they're still, you can come back from it. Absolutely. Um, but if you keep on making bad decisions like that, you won't come back from it, regardless of what, you know, if you're still here. So yeah, I think it, it's, we'll just have to see how it plays out. So, I mean, kind of along these lines, we, we, we've talked about your artistic journey, which, which was such a great story. And thank you for sharing that. I want to spend a, a few minutes talking about, you know, the present. So I'm curious, you know, your views, you were, you were deep in the crypto art scene when it was springing to fruition in 2019 and 2020. You know, I'm curious for your thoughts on, on how it's evolved over the last three or four years and if you're happy or unhappy uh, with how you kind of seen things play out. It's definitely a different space. Um, I mean, back in, uh, you know, like 2018, when I just first started, uh, I think I met like Pascal Boyart and, um, and a lot of money. And in 2018, early 2019, I started going to a couple of conferences, meeting artists like... Um, Vesa and Tom Badley in, in the UK, uh, and then Coldy and, um, you know, uh, Grilla in, in Bitcoin, uh, San Francisco 2019. And, you know, it was a very, very tight knit group of, of artists because there weren't very many of us. And so you kind of get to know each other very quickly. Um, wherever you are in the world, you have a conversation about art and crypto. Um, then there was the explosion, especially after 20, you know, by late 2020 and 2021, it just completely blew up where literally every single celebrity and brand out there was trying to jump in, you know, cash in on the bandwagon as well. Yes. So it, and then, but also thousands and thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of artists, um, traditional artists, uh, digital artists who'd been around and established, um, brand new artists, people just going like, I don't, I'm not an artist, but I'm going to figure out what this is and, and make some stuff and see what happens. Um, you know, and, and for better, for worse, I, it, it just became this huge, crazy melting pot of stuff and then PFPs. So am I happy with how it's turned out? Um, uh, you just adapt, you know, that's the thing you, know, you can bitch and complain about it and, 
this space moves on regardless of what you do and what you say. So you just, you learn to adapt. There's no point in, in shaking your fist yeah. at, the, <laughs> at the community from your front line. Um, I'm curious. So you've mentioned a lot of the artists that you were close with, you know, back in 2019, 2020, a lot of money, Pascal. Uh, I'm curious, are there any artists that you've kind of made relationships recently in, in the last few years? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, um, there's so many great artists and, and that's, uh, that's, it's, it, it, it's almost becomes overwhelming. Um, you know, I think it's the, the events, the going to the IRL events, um, conferences, where you really meet and get to know somebody. Um, it's one thing, I, although I never met a lot in, in the life was one of my biggest regrets, but going to an IRL event and, and actually getting to sit down and have a, a beer and a handshake or a hug with a, an artist or collector is absolutely the best thing. So I've met some amazing, amazing people. Um, Icky is, is one, uh, a lot of collectors actually, um, new, new artists. Gosh, you know, Archer, um, who I met at NFT London, he did a sculptural piece for a lot of money for the exhibition. Um, just coming to blank here, but, you know, tons and tons of, of artists that, you know, and again, the this, this space moves so fast. There are artists who I had good relationships back in 2019 who aren't here anymore um, or else they, they, they might be, but they're, they're just not as active or... Um, something's happened. So yeah, I, it's, it's a very, very fast moving space and it's, I think it's difficult. It can cause a lot of difficulties emotionally for people because you, you're always, it's, you're always in flux and there's nothing, it's very rarely something really stable and solid to hold on to, including if you can grab a, a hold of a few friendships and um, I think that's really, really important. Yeah, it definitely feels like, you know, uh, crypto art scene is kind of moving in seasons and mm -hmm. you know it's there will be a group of artists from this season and some will continue on in, into others and stay in the conversation and some do drift away and it's been interesting to to watch that play out and which have been able to kind of maintain and stay through across mm -hmm. the board um you know we, we've, we've touched on the, the scene overall i'm all, also curious to get your thoughts on you know plat platforms blockchains um, recently, you actually put a poll out on your Twitter. I'm going to pull this up. Um, it says it's a complicated question, but if it's 100% about supporting artists and giving artists the opportunity to make a living from their artwork, which blockchain is best? And you listed ETH, Tezos, Bitcoin, and others. I'm, I'm curious, um, kind of what what inspired that question, and you know, have you been you know evaluating other chains um, in, in the recent past? Yeah, I mean, I've Ethereum, like I said, it's, was the, my first, and and still, I I didn't know. I was just curious to see what other artists' thoughts were on this, and 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 it was really about the the finances. I know that Tezos has a, a an enormous and great community, great artists, um, very welcoming and you know kind of open arms type community. There seems you know with Ethereum, I'm not sure sure why it's it can be a little bit more toxic, but there's also probably you know, there's more money involved you know there's uh, an egos um you know bitcoin's just had a uh, that 7.9 percent probably 7.5 percent of that is from the the new uh, ordinals and explosion but interesting is as well you know i i am interested in, in minting on other chains um, definitely tezos um and just to just to to see um you know what happens in in the future get the, the work out there. And, and like I said, there's just, there's a different vibe about each each chain and the, the type of work, the type of artists that tend to kind of focus on on each one. So um, I think it's important. I think it's good for to diversify. Absolutely. I mean, speaking of diversification, um, the AOTM gallery that, that Vince, Vincent Bandeau, notable collector, has spun up of late, seems to have started to catch fire a, a little bit. And you know, some of just what I'm hearing, rumor mill, is that maybe Super Rare has fallen out of um, you know the best spirits with some artists and collectors of recent. I'm curious if you have a perspective that you'd be willing to share here 
um, on a kind of your, your view of the, the different platforms? Are you thinking about them at all differently here in, in 2023? It's, it is interesting. Um, I think a lot of the, the big platforms from, you know, whether it's the, the super rares and nifty, the known origin, the maker's place, they, they kind of fell from great. I think they kind of lost their way in by 2021. It just becomes such an enormous kind of cash flowing free for all that the, the focus wasn't on the artists anymore, especially the artists, you know, the artists who really kind of were there from the beginning and, and built these, these platforms up with the collectors. Um, it was, you know, 2021 was like anybody can just drop anything and, and make a bundle of money. And the, it's like a commercial gallery as an artist. If you work with a commercial gallery and that commercial gallery has a stable of, let's say, 30 artists and they can really focus on each artist. They know the story. They know about the artwork, the history. They can they can sell their work to their clientele. But if you work with a commercial gallery who has 300 artists or 200 artists, it's you know, it's enormous. There's, you just don't get the same type of representation and, and there's this, a very different relationship. Now imagine Nifty Gateway or Super Air, or you know, they they have literally thousands and thousands of of artists. They just cannot focus their energies on 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 an artist like they should if they're going to represent them. And that became the, the question: is like, well, why am I paying fifteen or twenty percent commission to a platform that does absolutely nothing for me except you know I'm in my work there and and that's it. I get absolutely nothing out of it. And, you know, even, you know, for me, I mean, I was like pulling teeth trying to get some kind of a uh, little bit of promo from from these platforms. Um, and so I can imagine being a, a less established artist and getting literally nothing from them. It made sense that the new marketplaces would pop up that really focus on building those relationships with the artists and with the collectors and really focus on the art uh, and not just about making as much cash as you possibly i think we seem to kind of keep them circling around these conversations of integrity and you know seeing true to yourself and focus on the long term the vision um as soon as you get start getting greedy bad things happen uh, that makes a ton of sense and you know you touched on this a little bit on some disappointment with the, the lack of kind of marketing support or, or help in that that promotion or outreach and I, that's a topic i wanted to touch on with you here um, before we wrap up is kind of how how you go about marketing. I mean, clearly it is a, a very important part of the, the digital art and, and crypto art space, if not one of the most important. Um, you've got a pretty active Twitter page. You know, I, I'm curious, have you always been active on Twitter? H has that been more of a marketing tool for you or kind of what what, what is your marketing approach um, via social media uh, in 2023? Yeah, I mean, I've always been, I've always been interested in social media as a way to kind of get my my work and my message out there. It's, of course, with the website, you know, I really put a lot of work into the website and the information there. But having a strong presence, social presence online, even in the traditional art world, it gives you credibility and and it gives the gallery confidence that that you're going because you've got a lot of connections. They can see that interaction. And it's the same in this space here. You know, there's a lot of very, very talented artists who just don't have the social media engagement. Um, and therefore, they don't have the same type of eyes on them and, and sales that uh, maybe a, a less talented artist or established artist does receive based on the fact that they just got a, a huge, huge interaction of, you know, online media presence and, 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 you know, a, a building of community. And, you know, we talk about that all the time. And it's become something that you don't, I didn't really think about 2018, even 2019, but by 2020, 2021, even though I was always very active on social media, it wasn't until this, things really took off in this space that you realize just how important that social media engagement is for your, for your brand. And it's things that most artists don't want to have to deal with. And, and to be honest, it's hard to find that balance. I spend, you know, I, pro I, I try to take some time off every once in a while, um, but it, it sucks you in and it can mess you up, you know, with your emotions and, and your stress levels. 
Um, and it keeps you away from the more important things in life, not only family and friendships, but, but actual work. And I need to spend more time on painting. So I, there's times when I have to say to myself that, you know, I'm not going to post anything or I'm going to just post something. And I don't, I, I have to stop replying to every single comment and liking every comment. And it's like, oh, how do I, I better repost this or, you know, engage with this artist here because it's, although it's important, if it detracts from the work itself, then yes, yeah, so you got to find a balance. Yeah. And it can take up so much time and it's always the, the angriest and loudest voices which, which pop up and they don't represent the entire community. Mm -hmm. It is interesting. So, I mean, community building is clearly one of the most important themes in digital art and NFTs right now. Um, but I've seen artists like Alpha Centauri Kid is one that I've been fairly close with and have followed his journey. Um, I've seen like some of his lowest points is when he's done free mints for his community and people are just firing off questions because they weren't able to get their, their free mint. And now they're angry and you know everyone's bringing the pitchforks, right? So it, it can backfire. You're just trying to do something nice, you know, for the community. But I, I want to touch on the castle party. We've got to hit this. Uh, you know, you, you've mentioned in real life events as being, you know, really important to you. Um, I'm curious kind of what inspired castle party one and maybe what's in store for the, the second annual. It's a good point that you made about, um, you know, the community and, and putting something out there thinking it's going to be great. And, and some people just get pissed off. You know, you can't, what I've learned is you can't make everybody happy. Um, you try to do something good. Um, and, and somebody's going to get pissed off. Um, you know, and I found out with the castle party, the fact that only, what 400 people could come to the it's like we call it the most prestigious nft event because it's very very small very limited um very exclusive but uh you know it is what it is for for me it was an opportunity to to give back to the collectors who have supported me to do something that is different in the space and i think that's very important i always talk about being different being unique you know there's a lot of great conferences out there i'm going to NFT paris uh, next week um you know i've been to a lot of different vcon all these different bitcoin uh, each one has its own vibe but i thought i want to do something for my collectors it's very very small very exclusive really immersed in in culture and, and history again can making that connection with my long tradition of of painting and in, in the traditional world and just the history of painting itself so it made sense to have some kind of interesting um event for my collectors and after the the bitcoin angel drop again like i said you have to adapt to crazy things like that happening my collectors are like you should have a castle party and i thought like yeah let's have, a, let's have a castle party not really thinking how much work it's going to be and how enormous of a, a project it's going to be but you know again and i i get into arguments with my wife she's like you know it's just why are you having this castle party it's like you know you need to focus on your painting and and you know what's what are you trying to do but for me it makes sense overall as a, the long-term vision and 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 my brand and reputation number one to be able to do something in this space something big and actually pull it off and, and follow through and put all the work and time into it and 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 do it and then pull it off i think it again it's about credibility that adds that that layer that level of of um credibility to my reputation that I, if i say i'm going to do something I, i'm going to do it i'm not going to pull out and at the last minute or say oh you know it's too much work um but also yeah it was just getting to meet people who supported me in real life and that's you know it would it would be a lot more profitable uh, financially beneficial for me to not put on the castle party um, to focus entirely on my work, to to just do drops and work on big collaborations with big art, you know. But for me, you know, now it's it's not about the money; it's about the relationships. And this is the perfect opportunity to build real, real life relationships. Yeah, I'm totally with you there. Uh, I kind of I, I didn't put enough focus on how important in real life events were kind of early when I was getting into the NFT space, and I made it more of a priority recently and just the, it's just so different you know communication online through avatars anonymously or pseudo anonymously 
is just totally different than, you know, shaking someone's hand and having a real conversation and putting a face to a name and being able to understand a lot more about where they're coming from. Um, so, I mean, th this, this makes a ton of sense. Uh, I think it was a great decision. I'm sure it was a, a ton of work, but kudos. I mean, it looks awesome. The photos are amazing. Um, well, well, Trevor, we, we are running out of time, but in our last couple of minutes, is there anything you, you want to leave us with anything kind of coming up um, that, that you want to share? Always stuff coming up. Always. Uh, let's see. I, I've got the the steampunk series behind me. Um, the plan. I'm going to be working with Apollo Entertainment. Um, they're the creators of Satoshi Verse. Um, great guys. Really talented team. So we're working on the animations to help bring in these paintings. I've got three huge paintings to bring to life. Um, I'm developing a whole story and mythology around this this work and how it links up with everything, including the Bitcoin Angel. Uh, it's 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 really really exciting, um, and then the castle party in uh, in France in September. Um, to go to my my website. You can see it there. Uh, it has all the information, and yeah, we learned a lot from this last one. I've got a, an enormous team of of two guys, Martin and David, who helped me out with with all this. So they've been absolutely amazing to to work with and to really kind of pull this crazy castle party off. But we thought like. You know, one night isn't enough, and there's so many people I want to spend more time with. So let's make it a three-day, two-night event in France, um, in a 16th-century chateau with a pool and a football pitch. There'll be like we're gonna have like a five-on-five -five soccer. Um, there's like wine and champagne tasting in this 12th, 13th-century medieval caves underneath the, the castle, the chateau. Um, it's just gonna be a yeah. I, I'm really looking forward to it. And again, it's it's a huge, huge, huge amount of work, um, and I should be focused on my painting, but it's just I'm very, very privileged and, and blessed to be able to do something like this. You know, like I said, you know, coming from this little village of 1,200 people in Western Canada, uh, and you know, getting to this point in my life where I can have a freaking castle party and people come from all over the world to to come and celebrate art and NFTs and innovation and culture and history um yeah it's 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 crazy how how things have changed over the the many years of my life it's such an amazing story you know from that very small beginning to now throwing a, a, a castle party a multi-day uh, event at the chateau in, in france well I, I gotta find out how i can make it to this party you um, gotta so come <laughs> it might be the nft event of the year um, well, well, Trevor, this has been amazing. Thank you so, so much for your time. You know, everyone listening, if you aren't already, make sure to, to go out, follow Trevor at Trevor Jones Art, check out his website, start looking at the at Castle Party too, start booking your travel. Um, Absolutely. But, <laughs> thanks, Trevor. That, that's it for today's show, everyone. Until next time, goodbye. Thanks, Tyler.